ready to start again. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Ludwig Rusa, who is a PhD student at the Normal Superior in Paris, and who will uh, give us an introduction to free probability and tell us how it emerges from uh, mesoscopic quantum systems, so from uh, quantum dynamics out of equilibrium, as we will see. So please, thank Ludwig. You. Yeah, thank you. First of all, everyone can hear me, or I need to talk louder or less loud? Good, okay, great. So I will tell you how free probability appears in noisy mesoscopic quantum systems. And uh, of course, um, this title is more sketchy than what actually is. So maybe if there is an experimental physicist working on mesoscopic systems, he will not agree. But <laughs> um, I, 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 I hope uh, it still comes close. And this, what I, my talk is based on this paper um, we wrote uh, recently, which is called Coherent Fluctuations in Noisy Mesoscopic Systems, the Open Quantum Step and Free Probability. And, uh, oh, okay. and uh, we will first discuss free probability, like most of the talk will be free probability, and then I show you a little bit the physical application, because I guess most of you are more interested in the mathematical side of free probability. So let's start with an introduction to free probability. And I'll start this by recalling what it means that two random variables are independent. It means that the joint moments, the expectation value x to the n, y to the m, factorizes into the individual moments x to the n and y to the m for all n and m. And in that sense, you can see independence in classical probability theory as a rule to obtain the joint moments, which is here this combination x, y, from the individual moments, which is this. So knowing the individual moments of independent variables is enough to characterize the expectation value of any multiplication of those variables. And this is something we would also like to do in the case of non-commuting variables. So let's now explore a little bit where this leads us to if we try to continue looking for such a rule. Let's take uh, as an example two random matrices A and B of size N. And uh, since we know what independence means, let's consider their entries to be mutually independent. And then we would like to do the same thing. We would, like to, we would like to obtain the joint moments from the individual moments. So let's try to do that. First, we could write expectation value of A times B. And since A and B have independent entries, we can see that this factorizes. But now you write something like expectation value of A times B times A times B. And then it's less clear how you can write this in terms of only expectation value of A, A squared, and so on, and expectation value of B, B squared, and so on. Of course, you can write this in terms of the moments of the individual variables, but we would like to consider that at the level of the matrix. Now, maybe you could object that it's not a very good idea to, as a measure, to take the expectation value because it just returns, again, a matrix, and something more reasonable would be to define a C-valued expectation value, where before we take the trace of the matrix, and then we take the expectation value, such that we end up with a C-valued number. And again, we can ask ourselves, is the notion of independence from classical probability theory enough in order to recover all the joint moments, now with respect to this new measure phi, from the individual moments? And uh, let's test it. Let's take a phi of A times B and take them to be two by two matrices. Now you can calculate what are these entries and you get that this is equal to this. And uh, in general, the condition that the entries A are independent from the entries B is not enough to ensure that we can write this as a factorization of the individual moments. So the idea of free probability theory to solve this issue is 
to replace the notion of what is independent and to replace this by something which is called freeness. And um, freeness, the definition of freeness, which I, which I will show you in a minute, is constructed in such a way to ensure that the joint moments of free variables can be obtained from the individual moments of these variables. OK, any questions so far? Good. Um, so uh, here's the definition of what is free. Um, we are given two non-commuting variables in some abstract algebra. Of course, I chose M in order to be like uh, reminiscent of uh, the, some matrix algebra, but for the moment, think of it as an abstract algebra. And also, we are given a linear functional which has the function of the expectation value um, that maps an element or from this algebra to a C number. And um, with respect to this expectation value, A and B are independent, sorry, are free, um, if for all polynomials, Pi and Qi, that satisfy this condition, that means the expectation value of Pi of A and the expectation value of Qi of B is zero. You can think of this a little bit like having centered random variables, okay, the expectation value of them is zero. Given these polynomials with these conditions, A and B are free if they satisfy this condition. So that's like the, only the most formal part of my talk. <laughs> but I thought it's nice that to give the definition and to show you a bit the flavor. Um, so what's written here? It's written that phi, this new expectation value, of an alternating product of P of A and Q of B, where P1 is a different polynomial from P2, which would come here and so on, until PL of A times QL of B, that this is zero. If you have this condition fulfilled, then A and B are free. Um, so now it's not at all obvious why uh, this condition will ensure that we can recover joint moments from individual moments. But uh, let's do some examples and explore the consequences of this for the example where we take A and B to be free and we choose the polynomial. I mean, this holds for all polynomials, so we can choose a specific polynomial um, to be A minus the expectation value of A. Now let's just verify. If we take phi of P of A, then we have phi of A minus phi of phi of A, but phi of A is already a C-value number, so the second phi doesn't do anything, and so we get zero. And the same we do for Q and B. And now I can use this uh, condition of freeness here, and um, and just apply it once. So let's do that first. Don't look what's on the right. We write phi of the polynomial P of A, which is here, times the polynomial Q of B, which is there. And since A and B are free, we know that this must equal to zero. Now let's multiply what's written there in the brackets. Oops, no. So we multiply A times B, then here's phi of A times phi of B, and then there are the crossing terms. And if we keep, in the end, phi of A times B on the left-hand side and put everything else on the right-hand side, then what we find is that phi of A times B is equal to the product of phi of A times phi of B. So in that sense, this definition ensures at the most basic level, or for the most basic examples, that we can recover the joint moment of free variables from the individual moment. Now, we could, in this definition, like make a easy change. We could, for example, put an n here and an n there. Then this is still a polynomial satisfying the condition that that's zero. And uh, we do the same here, maybe with a different, with, with an m. 
then we have an n there, an m here, and in the end, we will have n, phi of n times m is equal to phi of a to the n times phi of b to the m, okay? So, so that looks like uh, we recovered exactly the same as for the expectation value, just that we have to be careful of the non-commutativity of these elements. So actually, that's not showing that we can recover everything, because you saw that the problem for, render, for just matrices with a classical notion of independence came up when we were considering alternating products of A and B. Um, so that's why um, we also have to care about things like this. How to evaluate, for example, phi of A times B times A times B. And in a similar way, as I showed you above, we can use this definition by um, putting some polynomials exactly in the same way and find that this decays into a product or a sum of products of the individual moment. And here you notice the curious structure that appears. Like, it's not at all obvious why you find phi of a to the two times phi of b, the whole thing squared, times the, oh, there's a small mistake, sorry, uh, times uh, the last term. But uh, just to show you this, that like this new definition is quite rich and has a lot of structure inside. But indeed, it assures that you can find all the joint moments from the individual moments of the free variables. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Can you take the powers out of, uh, out of the arguments of phi? So it's like phi of a squared. Is it the same thing as phi of a to the whole thing squared? Um, phi of a squared is normally not the same thing as phi. No, sorry, this n and m are inside. If right, you take. No, I understand, but if you set n and n to be 1, yeah. and then a uh, uh, continues ah, to be the but same. But we assume that a and b are free. Okay. If you take b equal a, then they are not free any longer. Um, okay. Uh, yeah? Um, yes. Yes, I think so. Because usually you can take a functional, it depends on what is this phi you choose. What's, what's. Yeah, but I showed you before that often one takes this phi for matrices to be expectation value of the trace. And so in the trace, they commute. So there's a, usually one takes this phi with some cyclic uh, uh, invariance. But this really depends on what phi you choose. <laughs> okay, so then let, let me just uh, point out that there is a connection to random matrices and that's why free probability became um, um, so popular maybe. Um, and that is due to Wojculescu who is the founder of free probability and who developed the subject first completely abstractly in the context of some op operator algebras, and then in 1991, he noticed that there's a connection to random matrices, and in particular, he found out that if you take A and B from the Gaussian unitary ensemble, so this means A and B are Hermitian matrices where all entries are Gaussian-centered variables, complex Gaussian-centered variables with variance one over N, N the dimension of the matrix. Then if you take n to infinity, a and b become free in the sense that they satisfy this definition. And very importantly, one has to take n to infinity, otherwise it doesn't work. You saw before in the example on the first slide, if I take n to be two, then like, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, another example, uh, what term? another example would be if you take random matrices as Haar random rotated matrices. So Haar, sorry, Haar random rotated, yeah, matrices rotated by Haar random unitaries. Haar random unitaries are unitary matrices that are distributed homogeneously on the unitary group. And now you multiply a diagonal matrix uh, DA from the left and the right with, with such a matrix. And you do the same for D of B with another independent hair random unitary V. And then 
in the large n limit, you find that a and b are independent. And yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think that's true that because now for the moment I'm always considering phi to be something like the expectation for, for random matrices. I'm considering it as before to be the oops, uh, expectation value and then with a trace. A lot of these results hold if you take away the expectation value because there's a concentration of measure. Um, but uh, you can see it for this example, the last one of how random unitaries, you can see it a bit in a sense that um, the eigenvector structure of these matrices becomes negligible and the only thing that matters are the eigenvalues because the, 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 the eigenvectors or like become so, uh, so perturbed. It's just an intuition that the only thing that's important are the eigenvalues. And in particular, um, the fact that A and B defined in that way are free um, allows you to calculate the spectrum, so the eigenvalues of A plus B in the large n limit from only knowing the spectrum of A and the spectrum of B, which would not be possible if A and B are finite dimensional. Yeah. U and V could be. Hmm. Yeah, true. I think hard distributed random matrices are also independent from this deterministic random matrices. And Gaussian random uh, matrices from the Gaussian unitary ensemble are also free <coughs> from deterministic matrices. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for many other random matrix ensembles, but I don't know any, uh, all of them, so. <laughs> okay, um, then let's continue. Um, ah, right, um, since the connection to my physical problem um, is, uh, is via the notion of cumulants, I will take a few minutes to talk about cumulants. And I guess all of you know what cumulants are, right? Um, but maybe what you don't know is that you can um, define cumulants in this way. That is, so the cumulants, or also known as the connectic expectation value of a random variable with, which has moments m, n, can be implicitly defined uh, through this formula, where the moment, the nth moment, is equal to a sum over all partitions of the set of numbers 1 to n of a product where for each block in this partition you multiply the classical cumulant of order equal to the size of this block. Um, so there is a combinatorial way in which you can define cumulants. And since we will talk a lot about partitions and non-crossing partitions, I just want to make this clear. Um, so you have the set, let's take one, two, three, four, okay? And now a partition pi is something that groups this into several sub-blocks. For example, I can take one, two, and three, four. That would be a partition. And here I took n equal four. Okay, is that clear? I think it's yeah. Um, and so B are the blocks in this partition, so this is B. And the size of this block would be 2 in this case. Just to clear. Um, OK, so and let's give you a, an example um, for n equal 4. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, I like to represent these partitions in a graphical way. Um, and what I do is I draw. Um, uh, nodes on a circle, one, two, three, four, and then I connect all nodes belonging to the same block. So here, this corresponds to the partition that consists of a single block which contains all the four ML limits. Another example would be this one, which has a partition with a single element containing one and a partition containing two, three, and four. And then you can go on, you can 
put one and two in a block and three and four in a block and many other ways. You can also have each of the nodes in its own block. And a curious thing that happens, you can have a partition that when you draw it graphically like this, the lines cross. And this is something that becomes important in the notion of free cumulants, which is something I'll come to next. But first of all, let me give you an example how to use this formula. Um, if you have in now a little bit more general random variables x1 to x4, then you can use this formula and write them as the, the joint moment of x1 to x4 as the classical cumulant or connected expectation value of these four variables, which corresponds here to this partition. Okay, so here I chose a partition where which contains only one block. And so Cn is C4 in that case, the, the, um, cumul the, the cumulant of x1 to x4. Then for the next partition, which I drew by this, I have one variable in the expectation value of one variable alone and the other three together. Okay, is that clear? Like the logic of how you apply this formula. And then you go on and uh, you have other terms that appear. And also this last one, uh, you can associate it a term. Okay, and that's how you can express the joint moments through the joint cumulants using the sum over all partitions. Now, free cumulants, they um, are defined exactly in the same way, just that, okay, free cumulants, which I denote kappa of n, which you can also see kappa is a function of this variable n times of a variable a, which has moments n, m, n, are defined in the same way, just that here in this sum, pi is, uh, runs over all non-crossing partitions. So this means this partition here no longer appears, okay? So I take it away. And then I do the same thing as before. I can write you an example, whoops. Oh, it's still there. Where um, oh. I can write you an example where, where I evaluate the moment of A1 to A4 written as the uh, by its free cumulants. And let me illustrate you why this is a good definition of free cumulants, okay? Um, what we could do is to write down the cumulants of a classical Gaussian random variable, which you know all how to do, because the moment of this is given like this, x to the n integrated with the distribution. And if you evaluate this integral, you will find that this is equal to zero if n is odd, or n minus one double factorial if n is even. And now comes the thing, you can interpret this as a sum over partitions. And in particular, this is equal to the sum over all pair partitions. That's all partitions where the blocks have all size two. And that makes sense because if n is odd, then you can't partition this in blocks of two. If n is even, then you choose the first element. For the second element in this block, there are n minus one choices. The third element you choose again randomly, and the fourth one you have n minus three choices, and so on. So this is how to connect to the formula. And now comparing this to the formula which we had before, I will just flash it again, namely this formula here. You see that the cumulants are defined here, and that's why da, 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 the cumulant of second order is one, since here we only sum over pair partitions and all higher cumulants are zero. Now you can do the same thing with a matrix from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And in that case, we use this kind of expectation value. You know that it's the eigenvalues are distributed according to the Wigner semicircle. You calculate what this is. Again, for n odd, it's zero. For n even, it's some number called the Catalan number. And uh, you can do the math to check that this Catalan number is equal to a sum over all non-crossing partitions um, where all blocks have just two elements, so non-crossing pair partitions. And now you see that when you deal with Gaussian unitary, uh, the matrices from the Gaussian unitary ensemble, the free cumulant behave uh, really in analog to the classical cumulant for a normal random variable. And in particular here, you can reduce that 
the kappa 2 is 1, and the kappa for n bigger than 3, kappa is the free cumulant, is 0. Okay? So they really behave in an analogous way. And then there are many other things in which free cumulants are um, the right analog of classical cumulants. Yeah. Um, in the case of Gaussian unitary matrices, yes, but I mean, this is more general because yeah, you can, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Now you're asking what happens if you're looking at the joint moments of yeah. variables. Um, then you will get a... Um, I can't tell you by heart what it, what's the formula like. Okay. Yes. Sorry, can you speak louder? Yeah, yeah, true. Ah, yeah, in fact, uh, yeah. I, I've ref yeah. I presented you the formulas for a single variable, the moment cumulant formula for a single variable, but then in the example I showed you the moment cumulant formula for many variables, and in that way you, you would generalize it. Okay, so this is the end of my introduction to free probability, and I see that I'm already at 25 minutes. So now, theoretically, I have five minutes to talk about the physical importance of this. <laughs> any any uh, questions before I go on? Okay. So then let's change topic completely, and uh, let's look at this picture. Where the physical situation we're interested in is um, a conductor between two reservoirs at different particle densities, n a and n b, and since they are different, you will have a current flowing from the left to the right. And since uh, we I, we want to do quantum mechanics, I assume that these particles are fermions, and fermions are created by this creation operator C at position x dagger. And um, if you look at such systems, they usually display a diffusive transport. That means that the current at position x is equal to minus the diffusion constant of the gradient of the particle density. This is also called Fick's law or for the temperature of Fourier law. And is a, it's an empirical uh, result. Um, and secondly, we want to look at systems in which are in the so-called mesoscopic regime. So now there's this word appearing in my title. And what I mean by mesoscopic is that the length of the system is smaller or equal to the coherent length of these fermions traversing my conductor. And the coherence length of um, these fermions is the length over which they are able to quantum mechanically interfere. You have to think that in a real material, electrons will scatter by impurities, <laughs> and uh, with every scattering, they will become less coherent, and if you take a fermion from there and a fermion very far away from there, they will not be able to quantum mechanically interfere any longer. But if the system is small enough, then they haven't scattered by enough impurities yet, and they still can interfere with each other. And that's a regime where quantum mechanics is important because if you consider such a situation, then you could describe this um, sufficiently by classical mechanics. And um, as a statistical physicist, the big aim in such a setup would be to describe the probability distribution of the density profile of fermions in this conductor. So what's the density at position x? And what's the probability to observe a certain density profile in the steady state of this uh, current um, carrying conductor? Then what is the current profile? 
which is related to the density by the continu uh, continuity equation. Um, and finally, we could also ask ourselves, what is the probability distribution of so-called coherences? Hey, let just come back here. The density quantum mechanically would be the number operator at site X and then the quantum expectation value with respect to the state of the system. And if you re replace X by Y, then you get something which we call the coherences, um, which are, for those who know what the density matrix is, density matrix is just the off-diagonal elements in the density matrix. And uh, if the, the system is, uh, has lost all its coherences, they are zero. And if it's coherent, then they will be non-zero. And um, the idea would be to obtain the probability distribution of these three um, quantities um, in a universal way that means from only a very few system dependent constants, such as the mobility or the diffusion constant. Um, so that we would have a theory that at the mesoscopic scale describes many mesoscopic systems regardless of the, the microscopic um, uh, interactions happening once we know these few system dependent constants. And actually, on the level of the density profile and the current profile, this is known. Um, and a theory that does this is called the macroscopic fluctuation theory. Um, and actually, this is purely classical because it deals just with quantities that you can also describe classically. But what we are studying is how do the coherences um, fluctuate in such a system? And that's something that's purely quantum mechanical. Oops. And uh, the, the big, big aim would be to have an analog theory of this macroscopic fluctuation theory that includes coherences. To study such a, any questions? To study such a system, we uh, have a toy model. And this toy model is inspired by a classical stochastic process called the um, symmetric simple exclusion process. And we have a modification of this in order to include the effects of coherences. And uh, the toy model works like this. You have fermions that hop to neighboring sites with random amplitudes. And the randomness or the amplitude is given by the increment of a Brownian motion on each side. And these Brownian motions, they have a variance dt. So in a time step dt, the probability to jump is given by dwt. That's the interpretation. And since we have fermions, they can't hop to the right if there's already a particle at the right. Uh, oops, I'm considering spinless fermions, okay? We have to make things easy. Um, and so this um, system is described by a density matrix. Um, I'll just go over this and then I come back why free probability appears there. Um, the density matrix at a time step t plus dt is recovered from the density matrix at time t by conjugating with this evolution. And basically, what this represents here is just noisy free fermions where the Hamiltonian increment is given as a sum of the jump from i to i plus 1 multiplied by this noise and the Hamiltonian conjugate. And in order to model the boundary situation, we add a Lin-Bladian term that models the boundary. Never mind if you haven't heard that term. Um, OK, this, um, this problem is maybe, first of all, a bit difficult because it, the density matrix lives in a two to the n dimensional space. Each side has two dimensions, so n sides will be two to the n. But actually, it's a quadratic model, and that allows us to reduce it to n dimensions uh, when we define this matrix G i j which is nothing else than the matrix of all the coherences between side i and side j. And then we can write an equivalent evolution for this matrix g, um, which evolves with time according to some new um, Hamiltonian increment of size n and some new boundary operator. I'm not going into the detail. But what I want to show to you is that this basically reduces the problem to the study of a random matrix, matrix that under whose probability distribution undergoes uh, some time evolution, and that finally converges to some steady state, 
the steady state in which this system um, has reached probably a, count pro a density profile like this and has fluctuations around it that don't change with time anymore. And uh, now we could ask ourselves, um, this is a random matrix in a stochastic process with a yet unknown stationary distribution. How could we use tools from pre-probability theory to solve what's the steady state of this, of this stochastic process? And um, that's uh, how my last slide, where I show you two examples how free probability appears in this stochastic process. Um, ah, okay. Um, so something which this system satis like um, which this um, random matrix G satisfies, there are three conditions satisfied by this um, random matrix which are sufficient to make the connection to free probability theory. And we think that these three conditions hold more general for noisy mesoscopic systems and are not only limited to the toy model we are studying. And these conditions are, we'll just go th quick through them, um, the probability distribution of the matrix elements is U1 invariant, which can multiply by random phase, by faces from the left and the right at each side. Um, this means, sorry, that if you look at the expectation value of matrix elements of this form, they are zero, except if this is equal to J and this is equal to I. Because in that case, the phase cancels, otherwise it doesn't cancel. So it makes sense to look at expectation values of matrix elements where all these indices are arranged like in a circle. And that's why the second uh, um, condition is that the loops, so which are in such a circle where I arrange the matrix elements, scale with some power um, of the matrix size if all indices are different. And I present this by a circle here where I put all the indices on this circle. And then if the, you have the expectation value of several of these loops, it's, it, um, it factorizes. And actually, these three conditions, they pop up again in a completely different context, which Sylvia will talk to you about in the next talk. Okay, so it wasn't uh, for nothing that I explained you these three conditions, I hope. Um, and then what you can show with these three conditions, that if you compute the moments now of this matrix G, a little bit as we did before with the matrix from the Gaussian unitary ensemble, um, where we took phi to be the expectation value of the trace, so of the normalized trace. So I have one over n times this sum, which is the trace, and then here the expectation value. I can write it in a way where there pops up a sum over non-crossing partitions, okay? The term appearing here, I think I'll not explain it, but I, I just like want to make point out that these three conditions are enough such that all terms corresponding to crossing partitions vanish and that this object here is something like a free cumulant in free probability theory. The second point where free probability theory pops up is when we look at the stationary measure of the stochastic process. And um, to do so, I define just a rescaled version of the expectation value of Gs, which are arranged in a loop, such that I have a quantity that's of order one, because this scales with this um, order here. And now the curious thing is that if you sum these Gs up in a way as if they were free cumulant of some unknown measure. Okay, so what you do here is that you sum over all non-crossing partitions, then you have again this multiplication over all the blocks of these um, connected expectation values of our matrix elements arranged in a circle. You find that that's equal to just the minimum of these variable x1 to xn. So a huge simplification happens if you respect the um, the, this uh, non-crossing partition structure of free probability theory. And you can even realize this, these are the moments as the variables of some measure. And this result was found by, by Philippe Bian, which is a mathematician with whom we collaborated. So I think that's the end of my talk. Um, I will, yeah, this is something else. I will just like give you, ah no, like a small recap 
First, we talked about the fact that independence needs to be generalized to freeness. Then I gave you the definition oops, of freeness, showed you some examples, why freeness seems to be reasonable. Then we talked about classical and free cumulants and the notion of non-crossing partitions. Here I gave you this example. Then we had the excursion to a current carrying conductor and the description of this carrying conductor through a random matrix and the characterization of this random matrix through um, something that is free cumulant like. And that's it. Thank you very much. So you saw the second point I made, which was this one here. Okay. The second point I made is that the connected correlation functions in the steady state are the free cumulants of a measure that has moments minimum of x1 to xn. So this solves completely the steady state. You see what I mean? So in the end, what we're interested in is to understand all the correlation function of the matrix elements G, uh, I, J, and so on, in particular, the connected correlation functions. And we get them if we sum all these uh, correlation functions here. The, the G are these correlation functions. If we sum them up as if they were free cumulants, and then we find that this is this simplified considerably. So that's one way how free probability helps us to find the steady state. And to get there, we actually use this result I, I showed you before. Ah, you don't see the simplification. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can explain you later if you want. Um, no. I, the factorization of loops at leading order is something that is just a property of this measure and that a priori has nothing to do with freeness. We haven't worked this out, and we suspect that it's very difficult. But um, there is also a branch of free probability theory that's caring about these lower order corrections, and I haven't looked into that yet. But I think it's interesting. Yeah. 